So some of you know this already. I'm going to tell Patrick this just whilst he's getting ready. And uh, uh, is this is this how you expected? Is this good? No, not at all. I didn't <laughs> think so because I don't see anything here. Um, when we invite the speakers, they send us typically a profile about how they would like to be introduced and what they do, and it's pretty much a cut and paste of their LinkedIn. Uh, so the uh, stage crew sent that to me and said, "Here's how uh, hi you know. Here's the information we got." So I just hit delete and threw that away. Very good idea. Um, what I did do is start scrolling through your social media and looking for you online Ooh. to see is there something I could find that would be a good introduction for this audience. And yeah, that look of fear in your eyes right now of, oh my god, I was drunk, what did I say? What did he find? How far back did he scroll? And actually, I, I, I go to admit, you two guys, uh, uh, just like uh, Ged, you, you know, you don't have a huge amount of social media presence. Then you it's did a bit leak well. <laughs> and you don't say anything too risky. You're kind of a little bit, you know. So I got something. Do I you? think you're going to like it. I'm not going to embarrass you. What I'm definitely not going to do is blow your story. Uh, you're more than capable of doing that without help from me. So I think we're ready. I think so, too. I think so. I think you might need a little bit more volume. Can you guys hear him in the back? Because I, I know say that's something. I know do you hear me? I know that's going to start getting like, yeah, that's good. All right. Um, I found this fascinating. And I sort of reworded it a little just for my own uh, amusement. Oh, wait, we're still not done. Oh, you're getting a clicker. You're going totally professional. Because I found this genuinely fascinating. There is an untapped source for human potential. And this is what you've been exploring. True. And I'm not going to say too much about what that untapped source is. But I think you've kind of given it away. Is it what you're going to talk about today? Things right. like that. All right. So <laughs> I'm not going to say what it is. There is a huge, massive, I mean, like bigger than the planet, massive, untapped source for human potential. You see it every single day, and I'm fairly sure they've never even thought about it. Would you say that's true? I guess. Right? <laughs> because yeah. we just, it's there. True. Right? So, he's going to tell you more about it. You know how this works. It's your job to make as much noise as possible so that we get more of an audience. Like these guys, welcome, take a seat. And this lovely 82. You know how it goes, right? You're not going to let me down this time. No practice runs necessary. You've got it, right? You're going to lead. Yeah, you. A huge, warm campus party. Round of applause to welcome Mr. Patrick Zaman. All right, all right, all right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoy the fact that you guys are in here while it's really brilliant weather outside. Just been walking there and I thought, if I were all those people, I would probably be drinking white beer on a terrace here outside. But you guys are in here, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, dreams, about fulfilling dreams and uh, turning dreams into reality. And uh, to start with that, I have a question. Um, who of you guys have... Um, girls have an idea or a dream uh, that you want to fulfill, that you want to make come true. Cool. Could be a business, could be um, maybe a product, maybe it's a plan to go travel, uh, can be all those things. I'm really happy that there's many people here today that actually want to do stuff like that. So the thing is that when, um, when I was asked to um, tell a bit here, they said, can you, ask some, uh, can you tell something about being an entrepreneur. And the interesting thing, in my opinion, is actually that it's not really, it's not really a cool thing to be an entrepreneur. The only thing that it is, if you're an entrepreneur, is that it says that you have a company. Well, it's quite easy. If you want to become an entrepreneur, you go to the Chamber of Commerce, you register, you pay some euros. I think I it's even free nowadays, and you are an official entrepreneur. What is way more important, uh, way more precious also, way more important, and probably way more handy, is not being an entrepreneur, but knowing what an entrepreneurial mindset is. And that can help you in many, many more things. I think an entrepreneurial mindset doesn't necessarily mean that you have a company, but that you have the skill set or the ability to know how to turn a wish or a dream or maybe something else that you just want into reality. And this is what I'm going to talk about with you guys today. So this is my 
favorite uh, drawing of one of the Cartoon Network guys, and it's about making your own path, thinking of a way how to get to the place where you want to come and using whatever you need to do so. This is the entrepreneurial mind state. So if, you, um, if you're talking about this, if you want to become and uh, have this entrepreneurial mindset, what are the things that are important for this? Um, th there's people that talk about all different models, all different things, all different strategies. There's even people that I knew that say, yeah, you, you, no one, uh, you have to be born as an entrepreneur, no one is it already, or there's people that say, yeah, you, you can learn it. The last couple of years, I've been working with a lot of different people, um, young people, older people, and we were talking about this subject, how to turn your dream into a reality. And I found that actually, from all the people that I've worked with, uh, there's no difference. So it's not something that you have a talent for. It's not something that one is better in than the other. It all has to do with a couple of simple things. Um, confidence is a quite uh, important one in that. But I'll talk about that with you later. So when you want to turn a dream into reality, I just asked you guys, what is it for you that you want to do? Think for yourself. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's just one big thing in your mind. And think of the things. How did that idea get there? Maybe for the people that just said, well, um, I don't have an idea now. Or um, maybe you didn't dare to uh, stick up your hand. This is also something that I've heard a lot. Um, last, about three weeks ago, uh, I was talking to someone and that person said to me, you know, uh, I, I don't really often have ideas. Um, I'm not so creative. And this is another thing that I think is a quite a big mistake. Many people think they're not so creative or think that they don't have a lot of ideas, which is it interesting because I think we're all human. We're all wired in kind of the same way. And it's our brain and that gives us ideas. Creativity is not that much more than just the number of relations that are going on in your mind. So it's being creative part. Whenever someone says I'm not creative, I wonder if that's really the truth. Therefore, I want to do a, a little test with you guys. If you have paper and pen, please get it. If you don't, get your uh, handy or phone and see if you can open up uh, a notepad app or something that you can write in. Pen and paper works quite well. If you don't have anything to write something down, then just do it in your mind. That's also cool. So I hope you have uh, something. And I'm going to give you a little task. You have one minute to write down all the things, as many things as you can think of, all the things that you can do with paper clips. Go. One minute to write down all the things that you can do with paper clips. All the things you can do with paper clips. We have 30 seconds left. Okay, it's about 10 seconds. All right, thank you. Put away your pen or your phone. And then I would like to ask you to count how many different things did you write down? How many different things did you write down that you can do with paper clips? Everyone counted? Cool. So um, who wrote down more than three things? OK, who wrote down more than five things? Five, more than eight? Uh, OK, more than nine? Nine, more than 10? More than 11? How many? 15, 15 different things, really nice. Very well, okay, a applause for you. Um, everyone performed great here, of course. This is an interesting thing. Um, you also wrote something down, right? Can I ask you, what did you write down, for example? Um, to, to, uh, clean nails, uh, to clean nails. Hook for fishing. Hook for fishing. Um, 
uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but in a Haagspeld. Yeah. Um, a mini fork, uh, a saté, a saté prikker. All right. Yeah. Uh, a krabber and a spelt. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Nice, thank you very much. So, um, of all the people here, how many uh, people wrote down something uh, like um, use it to hold paper together or to hold something together? Cool. How many people wrote down um, to open a lock? Uh, also quite some. Nice. Okay. So it's interesting. So we had about a minute. Most people wrote down about five to eight things. There were some really extremists that had 15, really nice. Um, this test I do often with different groups of people. The interesting thing, what happens here, is what I just asked you, but I also see that many of you answer this way, is that when you write something down, you take it very literally what I say. Because I ask things you can do with paper clips. The interesting thing is, though, that something happens when you start doing this. Because what is the thing that all the things that he wrote down have in common, but also the things that I just mentioned, like opening a lock, uh, like putting things together, etc., is that all these things are useful. All these things are quite useful. All these things are practical in a way. And this is something I never asked you. I never asked you guys, okay, write down as many things as possible with, that you can do with paper clips that are useful, that are practical, that are really good for the world. But all you guys, most of you guys probably did. And this is interesting. Because I did the same test a while ago with a group of kids. They were about eight, nine, or 10 years old. And it was interesting. Because they didn't have five, eight, or 10 in this minute. They had about 20, 25, or up. The interesting thing was, though, when I asked them, so what did you write down? They said, well, yeah, you can, you can make an airplane of it. Or you can drown them. I'm like, drown an airplane? Yeah, yeah, you can put them underwater and you drown them. It's their way of thinking. You can all pile them up and kick them away. Yeah. You can throw them in the eye of the guy next to me. They, they said really crazy things. I also did this test with a group of people that were about 65 and older in age. They usually have three, maximum five things that they write down. And they're all very practical. Putting things together, making a necklace, and maybe the opening the lock thing. And this is interesting because what, tell, what does this tell me about creativity? That probably it's not that much your own brain that lets you fill your talent or your lack of talent for creativity, but it's more that the older you become, the stronger that voice in your mind becomes that says, well, this is okay and this is not okay. This is a good idea and this is a not good idea. And the interesting thing with this is that this voice in your mind, the little critter that tells what things are all right and not, becomes at a sudden point that big that you don't even know, that you're not even conscious anymore of the fact that you already had an idea. And this is something that I noticed a while ago, and that I was thinking, okay, can you trick your mind in making sure that it, this doesn't happen anymore? That all the ideas that come from your brain, and they do, because every time you're in a new situation, there's new impulses, there's new things coming in, ideas will be there. But how can you make sure you will not kick them out, that you will see the proper value of the idea? And that's where this comes in handy, a little book. This is something that I um, trained myself for already years and years ago, and this really helped me to make sure that I have many, many, many different ideas. This book is called My Idea Book, and um, I think I have about 30, 35 different books by now. Every year I have to buy one or two new ones, and what I do, I always have it with me. It's now back there in my, um, my backpack, and I write down all the ideas that I have all the ideas. Not because it's a good idea, because many are crazy and, and uh, totally impossible to do whatever with it, but I write them down. Because that way, I train myself with the idea that at least the idea is good enough to be there on paper. At least it's good enough to be out of my mind on paper. And what happens if you start doing this? The first couple of days that you buy this book and you have it with you, you will find that maybe every day you will have one or two ideas. And it's hard to write them down because you think, yeah, this is a stupid idea. It, it, it could be, I don't know. Write it down. A couple of days later, you will see that you, there start to become more ideas. More things pop up, more things come from your mind, 
And at a certain point, after a couple of weeks, there will be many, many, many ideas. And I did this with more than hundreds of people, and it worked every time. So whenever you think of yourself, okay, I'm not creative, I lack ideas, I don't have enough ideas, try this, and trust me, things will come. So what happened with me and my ideas? The thing is that uh, this entrepreneurial mindset all starts with ideas, but it also starts with uh, finding out that you're actually able to put something into reality. And for me, I think nowadays people say, yeah, this guy is a real entrepreneur, um, but this all started for me with this thing, a soccer table or a football table. When I was about 14 years old, I was in high school and I had a really uh, hard time there actually. Um, I didn't really like school uh, and school didn't really like me either. Uh, it ha happened a lot that I, I got kicked out of the school a couple of times and um, I think in those years I wasn't allowed in any class anymore and at the time uh, I usually when I got kicked out of the class I had to wait down there in the big central hall in our high school and this was quite boring because there was not that much to do but I had to be on school anyways um, although the last couple of years I wasn't I was usually waiting there until the next lesson started I always had to go, when I was kicked out of class, I had to go to the principal. He knew me quite well back then. And then I had to go down to the central hall. And it was so boring that I was thinking, can't, can we make this a bit more interesting? So one day when I was waiting there again with some friends that I always drew into this uh, trouble, uh, we were thinking, it would be cool if we could have a game here. So I went to the principal and I asked the principal, is it okay if we um, put a nice cool thing down here? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, can, can't you buy for the school a nice soccer table so we can play down there and he was like yeah no it's not possible so I said okay well why is why is that and he looked at me again well I said he knew me quite well and he was like what do you want then I said well it would be nice so we are less bored there and he said no nah, it's too expensive so I said okay so that day I, w I went home and I looked up okay how, how much does this thing cost I found it next day I went to the principal again and I said okay so if there would be money for such a thing would it be okay to put one down there? And he said, nah, it's not possible because someone has to take responsibility of the soccer table. Someone has to make sure that the atmosphere is right. People will fight over it. That's not gonna work. So next day, I went there again and I said, okay, so if in any given situation, it would be possible that there would be an, m enough money for the soccer table to be there on school and people would take responsibility, would it then be okay? And he said, yeah, well, I guess, but how is that gonna work? And I said, well, I, I want to buy one, put it down there, and I will take full responsibility over the table. I will make sure that no one will fight over it, that I will repair it whenever it's broken, that I will polish it and it looks nice, and it will just be there. So he was looking at me, quite suspicious, because he knew me, and he's like, are you sure you, got you want to do that? And I said, no, I really am. I really want to put that thing there. So he said, all right, if you make sure, if you take full responsibility, do it. The next three months, I didn't go to school anymore at all because I was working my ass off in greenhouses. I was picking tomatoes back then to earn as much money as I could to buy one of these tables. After that period, I bought one, put it on school in the middle of the central hall. Um, I put it there. I uh, went uh, to, the, to the intercom. This is something that they really didn't like. And I told everyone in the school that we had a soccer table now and everyone was free to play on it. What the principal didn't know was that there was a little box there where people had to throw coins in. And um, I think it was simple. So at halfway uh, during the day, the principal went to me and he said, come here, what the hell happened? And I said, what, it, it is there, right? And he said, yeah, but people have to pay money for it. I said, yeah, of course people have to have money, uh, pay money for it. So he was like, yeah, but um, why, why is that? I said, well, someone has to buy the table. And I think I did. He was looking at me again, didn't expect that. And he said, so you want to keep the money? I said, well, yeah, if you want me to keep responsibility over the thing, I think that's quite fair. <laughs> so he said, okay. The first day, we, I earned there about 120 euros on one day. I was about 14 years old. It was way more than I was earning in all the greenhouses picking tomatoes. The next day, even more, and the day after, even more. And I was really taking responsibility of the thing. I was really making sure the atmosphere was right there. The thing was polished nicely. I would repair the thing. And the next years after, I didn't have to work and pick tomatoes anymore because this was, was the thing that gave me a little income. But it helped me mainly by the realization 
wait, I, I wanted something to have fun there. I wanted to play soccer, and now I can. I feel responsibility, so I felt way more that I had a purpose instead of just being on school that I didn't like. And a part of that, I earned a bit of money. And this was something, okay, this is interesting. So the years after, when I was doing this, when I was doing this, I, w I, I went more into the path. Um, unfortunately, I really became a dropout uh, afterwards. My, uh, that resulted in big fights with my parents because they really believed that I uh, had to graduate and get my diploma. And um, it also one of the was one of the scariest things that I did, really deciding to stop with school. Um, not so much because society tells you not to, but ma mainly because the idea got stuck in my mind that without a diploma, without being graduated, it would be really hard to do something. When, like, together with all the fear of actually making the decision, another thing happened, and there was a, there was a lot of freedom suddenly in my life because I didn't have to go to school anymore. I didn't have to go to classes. I had a lot of freedom. So with that freedom, little things started to pop up. I had to earn money, of course, and I didn't want to work uh, in the greenhouses anymore. So things started. I had, another, I had some other ideas um, that became bigger and bigger. And when I was 16 or 17, I had an idea of maybe starting a little company at the coast of Holland where we would buy a speedboat with the tubes behind it and people, because I grew up in near the coast, and people would pay a bit of money uh, to be in the tube behind the speedboat. I saw this in Spain, I saw this in France, it was really expensive, but I thought, you know, maybe we could try it here. So the whole summer I worked on that, um, tried to earn money to raise, uh, start that thing also, and it was an immense failure, it was an immense failure. Um, I, in the end, find out why these things are not there in Holland, these companies. It's simply because we don't have enough sun for that. Uh, that summer there were about three sunny days, um, so well, I, at least I could ride on them once, but it didn't really work out uh, at all. But it was a good lesson. And these times I went on and on, finding and uh, starting more projects. So at this time, um, these are the projects that I'm working on. There is about 10 companies uh, that we successfully founded and, uh, uh, and have. The interesting thing, though, is not so much that these are the successful companies that we have nowadays, but these are the unsuccessful projects. And this is actually what I want to talk about with you. Because this, the successful projects, is something that many people usually talk about when they're on stage. And these things, not that much. All the unsuccessful projects are things that I wanted to do, and I tried, I found it, and I quit. All the successful projects are things that are still there or that, in my opinion, were quite successful in the end. The interesting thing is that these two things don't necessarily say that I'm a successful entrepreneur, that I'm a talented entrepreneur, that I'm a good entrepreneur, that I have good things to work with, but they mainly say that I do a lot of different things. And this is something that I really want to share with you because I think entrepreneurship is not that much more than evolution. If you just try a lot of different things, you will find some of them that work and some of them that don't. If I look here at the whole project, all the things that I did, some of them really worked out quite well on the market, but I just didn't like them myself enough, so I quit. Some of them I really like to do myself, but no one wanted them, but I tried them. And some of them, they did work because I like them and I think the market likes them. So I think in the end, if you wanna, uh, start working on your dreams. Let there be one thing clear for you. I, I don't think it really, it's, it's, it's about talent or it's about things that are skills that you have, but it's mainly about the fact, are you willing to start? Are you willing to try them? And if they don't work, it doesn't matter. If you fail, it doesn't matter because there's still heaps and heaps of years ahead of you where you can still try many, many other things. Don't give up. I want to share with you two experiences that, for me, were really important and that I'm really proud of. The first one is this. This is break here. When I was about 18 or 19 uh, years old, um, I was having a company um, where we were developing uh, electronic product to learn to play the piano. And this was a strip that you could put behind the keys of your piano, and it would teach you how to learn to play the piano. Because back then, I didn't, I could not read notes, and um, I wanted to learn how to play the piano. So 
uh, together with some other people, we thought of a um, LED strip you could put behind. You could download the MP3 song, press play, hear the music, and then little lights would show above the keys what keys you had to hit. You could put it real slow and work on it. And this was a thing that I really liked. Although I had no experience at all with electronical uh, development or with design, this was something that we were working on. I was really having to learn a lot. And I really liked the fact because this was something that I found out that if you have to learn something, you will find your way. In those months, I went to China because I thought, okay, this is the place where uh, all audio products come from, so I should probably should be there. I think if I look back to it now at that moment, it was also one of the most naive decisions I ever made because I was 18 and something and I was in China and I had no clue what to do there. I was literally, I, I still remember myself there in a hotel in Beijing thinking, okay, so I'm here now in China and now what? I find out I was later on, I, I was there for a couple of weeks, I find out I was in the total wrong part of China because apparently product development all happens in the south. So I flew to the south. Um, everyone was trying to get money out of me. Um, it was a real crazy adventure. And uh, I almost thought, okay, what the hell's going on? I have to leave the country right now. Luckily, on King's Day, I, um, I was invited on the embassy of the Netherlands in the south of China where uh, I met some people that said, dude, what the hell are you doing here? You're in the total wrong part. You should be there and there and there and we'll help you a bit on the way. And that really helped me to, um, to work on that. And the interesting thing was that when uh, I was there, I found uh, um, some people that could help me with the product development that in a couple of months, we had the product ready and it would be ready for a market launch. Um, in the end, we sold the patent to uh, Mattel, uh, who also develops Barbie, and they took it on from that moment on. But it was interesting because I learned, okay, so here I found my way and I, uh, it was a real nice experience. And I think if you want to learn something and you dive into it, you will find your own way to actually know in the end what's needed. There was one thing though, that every time when I was uh, in the company, working on a project or working on different dreams that I wanted to uh, turn into reality, um, many people always ask me, okay, so are you more happy now than you are, uh, than you would have been when you would have graduated, when you would have a diploma. And I always said, yeah, of course, because education is stupid and it's not organized well. And here in the Netherlands, it's only about learning mathematics and, 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 and science, etc. And you don't want that. And people said, well, maybe you do, but uh, what do you think about it? And I, I heard myself complain about education a lot of times. So after the adventure with the piano maestro, as it was called, I was thinking, okay, if I complain about education that much, would it be interesting to turn it around? Would it be interesting to maybe do something in education? And that moment, I thought, okay, maybe if education could be a bit more inspiring, this could be something that I would have fitted in if I would be on school. And this is where it started, I was starting thinking, okay, how could you reform education? What could you do also? And um, I started a company uh, I went teaching on high schools myself because I wanted to find out how are things going there, how does it work, and how can you make sure that if you're on school, and you, I think the idea of school is already quite insane, where you have to, where you put a lot of people for four, five, or six years within some walls with the goal to let them be able to know more about the world. But I thought, okay, at least if you put more inspiring people there, maybe that works better. So we started a company with people getting there that were uh, more inspiring, but still there was a lot of hesitation. I found out that the whole educational thing that was going on was very conservative and it didn't really work. What happened then is um, I met a girl. I actually knew a girl from here, uh, Utrecht here and when I was living here and she uh, told me something. She, saw, uh, she asked me, what do you think education should be about? If we go to the root core of education, and together we were drinking a beer and we were thinking about this. And I thought, well, maybe it shouldn't be about learning that much, all the things, because I think people, if they're really willing to, they can learn themselves. But it should be more about the strategy of learning. But she said, yeah, but if you go even under that, what would, should be the core of education? And we were brainstorming about this and we came on, up on a fact, maybe it shouldn't be about strategy of learning or learning things itself, but it should be about the question why. Why do you want to learn? Who are you? What is your path going to be like? And why 
What is the reason that you want to learn? Shouldn't that be the core of education? Shouldn't that be the thing that you should learn in school? And this is where an idea started. Together with her, we were thinking, okay, so if we could transform education, if we could do something that talks about these core things, what should it be? And um, I was asking people around me, what are questions that you are coping with now where you think of, I really wanted, I, w I would like, ha I would have liked it if these things, these are the things that I would have learned on school. And I was thinking maybe it's about making choices. Because this is something that I was always wondering at, how do I make choices? I called my grandparents and I asked them, why did you do the things that you did in your life? And they gave me an answer that was so dissatisfying because they said, well, yeah, it was just the way it is. We did the things because that was how it goes, how, uh, how, it, how it went. So I was like, okay. Then I asked them also, what are the things that you think would have been really, really interesting if you would learn them, if you would have learned them on school? And they said some things that really interested me. They said maybe a subject about love, or relationship, or grief, or starting business, or being able to turn something into reality, or coping with other people, or how to be uh, in a good team, if how to get out of fights, things like that. They said these were the live questions that they were still struggling with. So I thought this is interesting. We thought of an idea. Let's uh, f uh, start a training program for young people, age 9, 10, 11 years old, when they're still in primary school, and let's start talking about that subject with those people, with those kids. Let's find a very playful way, a very playful way of training, where we can actually work with those subjects with them. Those really big life questions on primary school, would it work? And we thought of a whole plan how to make sure that we could have make that happen. This, we wanted to start that in September, on the first primary school here in the area. But a month before, a lot of things changed in my life. I think that year was the real crazy roller coaster for me. Because the summer before, I was traveling in the United States and I got a call that a friend of mine, who I was working at in one of the other companies, um, had an accident and he died in Italy. At that moment, I had to go back immediately to Holland had to uh, fix everything, and, it, and it, I, was r I was in a big shock because this was something that I never expected. In my opinion, all young people w always had infinite lives or something, so it was a real big shock for me. A week later, something even worse happened. The girl that I was working with for this project to do it on primary schools also died, and she decided herself to step out. And this was something that really shocked me because in the, mo in the weeks after, I just had no clue what happened. I couldn't believe it at first. I thought it was that something else must have happened. And, and it w I was just shocked. First I was really mad and really angry. It later became more sadness, but I just didn't know what happened and what went wrong there. And after a lot of talks with her parents, with her sister and other friends of her, we found out that actually all the things that I was talking about with her all those live questions, all those things that you have to cope with if you live in a Western civilization like we do, where things go in a quite a lot big tempo, with quite a lot of phase, where it's mainly about who are you, what is your image like, and how should you perform, when do you think things are good enough, were all things that she couldn't handle anymore. And this gave an, a real big extra dimension to the whole idea that we were always talking about. So that winter, I was really th thinking about this myself a lot, and I thought, okay, maybe there is a core underneath everything, and that is the most important thing. Do you feel okay the way you are? Before you can think of why do I want to do something in life? How do I make choices? What is my strategy and how I'm gonna learn things? Do you think you are valuable enough as a start to actually do something? Do you feel self-confident enough to actually be there? And this became the basis of one of the biggest projects and one of, I think, in my opinion, the most important project that I'm working on, which is called Break Year. Break Year is now an organization, uh, and it's a school. We started a school. We have a couple of hundred students now. Um, they're mainly uh, aged 16 and up, so a bit older than we uh, thought of first. 
We have a, a couple of campuses in the Netherlands, and it's all about one single thing. We offer space. We offer space for you where you can be free, where you can be yourself, and from that point on, you're going to decide yourself what do you want to learn. So what are the life questions that you think are really important for you? We don't have teachers working there. Teachers put something in you, but we have coaches working there. They get something out of you. And I think this is a real important difference in the way we operate. Um, this is a picture with one of the first groups we work. It's a 10-month program. It's all about personal development. It's all about questions. Who are you? What do you want? How do you make choices? And it's all about finding the self-confidence. From So at the end of the year, they feel stronger. They feel better. And they feel, and that's most important for me, that they don't have to do everything themselves. That all these life questions are something that we all have to cope with. And if we do it together, then maybe a lot of interesting things happen because you will find more confidence. You will find more tools. And the older you grow, the wiser you become, the easier it gets to actually use all those things to go out, to learn, and to get all your own ideas and dreams into reality. I was here last week again, and uh, it's really, really nice. If you see someone um, like a young kid get in at the beginning of the year, and you see how they change now in, the, in the May, June, it's unbelievable. It's not that they grew that much, but they grew that much in their eye. So what I also want to show you is the next project. And it's a movie, and it starts immediately if I uh, put it on. So that's why you still see this. It's the latest project, because break is there now. And there's uh, something else that I've uh, always wanted to do, and I, that I really, really makes me happy. And that's in the subject of aviation. And uh, when I was a young boy, I always wanted to become a pilot. Yeah. I don't know if there's any other young boys here that wanted to become a pilot, but I always wanted to. And actually, we are working on some really cool subject in aviation right now. Um, the newest company that we started is called Avi. And Avi is um, a con company that we uh, started in Noordwijk, together with the European Space Agency that's here in the Netherlands, where we uh, thought of a new aircraft, a new drone, and a new idea. And I'm going to show you the video, and then I will tell a bit more about it. I don't think the sound works. But it doesn't really matter, I can tell you. When you think of me, think of what your day would look like. If you could take off at any time from wherever you are, fly directly to where you wish to be, while you enjoy the freedom of your personal flight. I am Avi, your self-flying personal aircraft. When you think of me, think of what the world would look like without traffic jams, noise, and pollution. And with all the precious time for what really matters to you. I'm Avi. I take off and land anywhere you want me to. And I fly with zero emissions. Space Agency, we are currently developing our first prototype for a market launch in 2017. Now is your opportunity to get on board with us. Are you ready for takeoff? So this is Avi. How the hell do you make a step from education to developing a new type of aircraft? Well, it's, this all started for me also again with an idea. I was back home at my parents' place and uh, I found one uh, magazine that I always used to read when I was about eight years old. It was called The Cake, maybe Dutch people know it, and uh, it was a young popular science magazine. And this was a really old edition. 
that I was actually reading when I was about nine or ten years old with my dad, and it was about things of the future. And it was the same thing. I was reading it, and I thought, nah, many, many cool things actually happened. All the things that they uh, expected that would happen in the future were there. Video, video, internet calling, things like that, how big the internet would become, internet of things. There was just one thing that wasn't there, and that was the page of the flying car. And I was thinking about this. How can it be that it still thing is still not there? There's helicopters and our aircrafts already for over 100 years. We see electric cars driving everywhere nowadays. So why is it still not possible for me to fly in my own personal aircraft? And I was thinking about this, and I thought, I sold the, lo the, the latest company that I was uh, having, and about one and a half year ago, I was thinking, okay, what is it? Is it really not possible, technical feasible? What could it be? And I found some people um, that were from the University of Delft, that were aerospace engineers, and I just asked them, would it be technically possible to make a drone that's man sized that you can actually transport two people with? And they said, yeah, well, technically it's possible. I said, okay, it's interesting. So why is it not there then? So then I just called um, some other uh, scientists that were working in drones area. I asked them the same question. Do you think it's possible? Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Well, then why isn't anyone doing it? Why is it still not possible for us? And they said, yeah, because regulation and legislation tells us it's not allowed. So I called the government, the ministry, and I asked them, why is that not allowed? And they said, yeah, because no one is actually building them. <laughs> so we were all waiting for each other. I found a couple of companies that had ideas over the world, but I thought, you know, these are, there were a couple of companies that said, okay, we're actually building a flying car. So there was a car with uh, retractable wings, so you could drive to an airport. It takes half an hour and you have wings and you could lift off. I think their prototype crashed about four times now, so I don't even know if that's a real proper solution. And I thought it was a bit, a bit big, a bit messy. So wouldn't it really be cool to just start with the idea of a drone? One and a half year ago, we put a bit of money in it, and we went to the European Space Agency. And we said, okay, would this be a cool thing to, to develop and to work on? We partnered up with people from the ministry, people from the European Space Agency, some scientists, and we said, okay, let's try it. Let's do this. They uh, gave us a bit of funding, and at this moment, we're actually working on this thing. Um, it's a two-person uh, drone that takes off vertically, fully electric, and flies horizontally. And with that, it has the benef benefits of a helicopter or a normal drone. So you can take off vertically and you can hoover all around, but you're also capable of flying horizontally, which is way more efficient than most other drones do. It's self-flying, so it's fully autonomous, so you don't have to be a pilot to fly in it, and it's electric. Interesting, huh? The cool thing is that although this is really a big challenge, and it will take years and years from now and millions and millions of euros to fully develop this and make sure that you're actually able to fly and allowed to fly, the base concept is something that we can already use. And we are at the moment doing it in a smaller product. This is the AV1, and this is the first product that we have developed. Uh, this will be on the market next year. It's not for persons to fly in, but it is the same concept. It takes off vertically, flies horizontally, and it's way bigger than regular drones. It's about two by two meter uh, size, um, and it can transport things in a weight of about 15 kilograms. We're using that um, together with um, some NGOs, uh, the transplantation, transportation of uh, organs, for example, is a really interesting uh, subject for this. If you have a donor and you have a heart and you have to transport it to another donor, this is usually taking uh, too long. Um, a heart can only be out of the body for about two hours max. We do this now by using ambulances, by blocking uh, roads uh, with a whole police escorts, and it takes even way too long. So if you use a drone for that, it's way more interesting. And you will be way quicker, you could actually save lives. We're also uh, using it for um, med medical supplies and uh, deliveries and for search and rescue missions. And at this moment, we're actually, we, we've, we've built it, we're testing it now, and it's a bit too big to take, but um, if you go on av.eu, you can see some some of it. So this is a project that I'm working on now. It was something that about uh, one and a half year ago, I thought, okay, I know nothing about aviation. I, I'm not an aerospace engineer, but at this moment, we're actually working on it. So again, I hope it shows you that you don't necessarily have to know everything if you want to start something. So this is the last thing I want to show you guys. How can you make sure that if you have your own dream, 
if you have your own idea, maybe a dream sounds too big, but if you have your own wish, how can you make sure you actually start doing it? Because dreaming is one thing. I told you about creativity and about how we're all creative. But if you have the idea, how to actually start. And this is a model that I always use for myself because it really helps me a lot by taking that first step. I start with drawing a goal, number one. What is the goal? What is your main goal? When is your project or your dream or your wish successful? And you can use this for anything. If you want to travel to the Amazon next year, that's an awesome goal. If you want to start a company, that's an awesome goal. So it doesn't matter how big or small your goal is. But draw it out. Just put it there and, and that's a real important thing, put a timestamp on it. Make, make really be clear about it and say, okay, I want to have this at this date, at that time. That's going to help you. Then, step two is the requirements. What do you need to have that? One and a half year ago, I wanted to make sure that in 2023, there would be a flying drone, a flying AV, a two-person vehicle. But I didn't know anything about aviation, so we needed a team. I needed to learn about aviation, so I had to read a lot. We needed money to do so. We, had, we needed partners to do so. So all the requirements I wrote down on the left part, and that gave me a real nice insight on, okay, so what's necessary? That doesn't mean that you have to know everything, but at least you have it. Then you come on, what do you have? So what are your own talents? What are your own skills? And if you know them, and if you are conscious of them, if, you, if, they, if, if they give you a bit of insight in what you are actually capable of, it helps you a lot by defining what is probably the easiest path for you. For example, I knew that I had quite some experience with being an entrepreneur. So looking really into the market, what works, what not, helped me a lot there. But there's many other things that I didn't know. So I could think, okay, if, this is the th if these are the things that I, I'm quite good at, how can we use that in the best way to make sure we get to the goal as quick as possible? And number four, the possible obstacles. What are things that could, could be in your way? What are all the things that could go wrong or that hold you back? And if you find all those things, and if you define them, and trust me, there will be many more that you didn't see coming, but if you start with doing this, you will feel more confident of the fact that you actually define them and you can find a way around them. And then the last thing, define steps. And I have a maximum of five steps because there will be millions, and usually um, your path will look different than a straight line, and usually many more steps will come in between, but just think of the five steps that are in between now and your goal. And if you have those five steps clear, I want the first step to be, what are you going to do tomorrow? Because this is the biggest one. There's so many things that we always want to do, that th and they never come there. They never start, because we don't know how. But if you can relate it all the way back to the smallest step possible, the step, what am I going to do tomorrow? What can I do tomorrow? Or even better, today, that's gonna really going to help you. And it can be anything. It can even be phone a friend, call him, and ask him to help you by defining your steps. I, s I told someone last week. Okay, that's cool, that's a good start. So if you have that, if you did the first step, other things will become easier. But this is the model that I always use, and uh, what I do is I put it above my bed. So I have it on actually on the opposite wall. So every morning when I wake up, the first thing I see is this. I'm literally looking to the goal that I defined because I know I'm really easy to distract, to do other things, to have other ideas and projects anymore. But this way, I make sure that it's always literally on my mind, in my eyesight, and in my focus. And that really helps me a lot. So, all the things that you wanted to do, please try them. Just go. Don't mind as they fail. And uh, I hope you all succeed by fulfilling your own dreams. Thank you very much. And I think there's a bit of time for questions. Yeah, yeah, we got a bit of time. Cool. So anyone that wants to ask a question. What are your next steps that you need to get to get to commercial spe uh, flight where you're aiming for? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so the next steps for us are at this moment um, actually based on three things. One is the first product. So we're really working our asses off to make sure that the first product is is ready and safe enough for flying and using all the and, and being able uh, so that we can use it for all the transportation needs. Second one is regulation legislation. So we are now talking with the government. How can we make sure that we are actually able to fly? And it seems that at this moment and 
also next year we're not allowed to fly here in Western Europe. But there are some countries that we are allowed to fly, Norway, Switzerland, etc. So we are heading there to make sure that we can actually test their staff, etc. And the third one is funding. So we now have about uh, a half to a million euros in the company, but it's we need way more to actually take the next steps ahead. So we're looking for that everywhere. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got a question. How do you stay motivated when you see your competitors doing the same thing you're doing? For example, with your uh, drone, uh, in January at uh, the CES in Las Vegas, a uh, Chinese company, Yuhang, uh, showed their model for a flying uh, drone, uh, which seemed to be operating. How do you cope with that, and how do you stay motivated to, to keep fulfilling that dream? Yeah, good, good, good question. Because when I heard about it, I was really pissed. Uh, because they had a real nice thing. Um, so I thought, man, they're earlier. But then I found something else. First of all, um, their, their product is different. It really works on a different way, so um, we're not really competing with each other. Um, we have the, the horizontal fly, they don't, they have other things, so it doesn't really matter. Then I thought, but actually, the market is so big, there's none of them flying around nowadays, so why the hell shouldn't there be more, there, there should be more competitors, because then at least, we make sure that in the end, the vision is there, that we actually have that. And uh, as a third thing, I think it's usually better if, if there are competitors, because then people start to think about the fact that it is actually possible. So the fact that this Chinese company had that much attention, make sure that people were thinking, okay, so apparently it is possible in the near future that you can fly with a drone, that you have your own personal aircraft. So it, it helped us, in a, it gave us a big advantage actually, because it became more visible. And maybe as a last one that really keeps me motiv motivated is that I don't necessarily want to have a company, it's more a tool. So I, what I want is that I can fly in one of these aircrafts. It's the same with break here, uh, with, with the education thing. Um, another uh, People ask me, yeah, there's other people doing the same now. I said, yeah, cool. Because it, uh, I think it, it actually helps me. The best thing is if education adopts this so we can stop, because then we got there. So what it motivates me probably even more, although I was a bit pissed the day after. Yeah. Hello, my name is Paul. I see you doing uh, many, many things. Uh, I have a little bit the same. And can you tell something about focus? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my big, uh, big problem too. Um, what what I know is that um, if if there's too many things going on, too many projects, then you lose focus and all of them will become less uh, productive or less good. So what I try to do is uh, not work on more than three projects at the same time. And what I try to do is uh, make sure that as quick as possible we have a team around every uh, thing we work on. Because then the other people will make sure that I focus on that thing. So uh, for example, um, with AV, I know that when I started with the idea, there were a lot of other ideas that I was working on. So I got distracted that that many times. So I just asked a couple of people to help me out, form a team. And usually, when they are together, that's the main focus. So they make sure that I will be there uh, always for this single purpose. It also helps a lot to start with a place, so you know that you don't do different subjects or different topics or different projects at same places. So we make sure that for AV, we have this place. So when I go there, I only work on that place. I have a mailbox that I is just for AV. Um, I don't open the other things. So I have to make sure that for my own mindset, it's all about that topic, and it helps me a little bit. Uh, hi, Patrick. Thanks very much for your inspiring talk. I wonder about the security of when, because I know this is going to happen, when there are going to be a lot of them. W sorry, when there are going to be a lot of uh, flying devices. Also drones. Uh, it's uh, I think it's a concern only for drones. But if there's a person in a drone and there's a lot of them, it's like it could be a traffic jam in the air. <laughs> I don't know. Could could definitely be yeah, exactly. Well, this is interesting, and um, this was also uh, a concern for us, of course. The interesting thing is though that there's a lot of developments now going on in automated air traffic controlling systems. Uh, one is a, uh, the biggest one is from the NASA in the United States, and what they actually thought of is an automated system where all the drones that will be in the air one day have contact with each other and define their best path to fly through. 
Um, this helps uh, to make sure that it's not needed to have a person as an air controller anymore and um, will keep things way more safe and secure. So this is uh, something. And of course, what's a real important thing is that also other things that are not in the system, for example, uh, a balloon, uh, because a balloon doesn't have a sensor on board, can be detected. So we, uh, we're using um, multiple redundant um, air crash collision avoidance systems that can detect balloons or other objects in the air and make sure that we can avoid them. Uh, hi. Um, two quick questions. One is what strategy do you use to find the talent that you need? For example, in, air in areas that you're not familiar with, right? So what strategy do you use? And the second question is, uh, same, same question, but different angle. Uh, what strategy do you use to find your mentor? To my mentor? Yeah, if you have any. Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, first question, um, it, it, for me, it, it seems that it usually starts with uh, social media. Um, I, I just put out a message. Does anyone know a person that has a background in uh, aerospace engineering? And usually there's some people that pop up. And I just ask them, I, this time I ask them, would you be willing uh, to join me? I'll pay dinner for you and beers and just think with, we, think with me about a little bit about the subject and the idea. And that time I met a lot of people and I was just thinking, okay, with whom of those people I have a nice connection with and could help me? So, and this gives me a little more insight. And I asked them, so if I'm a total new person in this whole field, what do you think is most important for me to learn now? Uh, because I don't have time to study the whole six years, tell me. And then they usually give me books or give me ideas, a presentation, and I just start learning, using them uh, as a person. So that helps me a bit with that one. And uh, about uh, um, the mentor, um, I think what, what, what I found actually is that because it's every time a new uh, um, thing that I'm working on, it's really hard to find someone that can help you with everything. Um, one of the first things that we always uh, start with when we start a new project or an organization is a board of inspiration. And a board of inspiration is like a board of advisory, but really more an inspiration. I just always ask people that are uh, familiar in the whole uh, field or that are really well known or really experts, and I just ask them, okay, I'm not gonna ask a lot of time of you, but would you be willing to maybe once in every two months or something, just think with me about how we're doing everything. And people are usually really, really, um, helping in that uh, sort of sense because I think it's nice that people are working on uh, little startups and little dreams and that really helps me a lot. So, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, as per the campus party tradition that was already in place, we have a little gift for you which is one of our pretty tents. Not sure if you've been to the camping area yet. Not yet. Um, check it out. Um, if you want to stay over, free, feel free to pop it up or take it home. And let's have another round of applause. <laughs> and maybe a quick Q&A on the side. A quick? Yeah, I'll yeah. be here. I'll be so here. if you have any questions, Patrick will be standing at the side and taking some questions for you. Thank you again.